question. Um, let's see again. I, I'm I'm gonna skip some some facts. Uh, so, um, if you got any questions, um, ask me afterwards. We we've got a short window from uh, at about 15 minutes for questions, or you just catch Jan and me. We will be um, at DevConf until tomorrow afternoon. Um, how Linux got started? Um, there may be differences in what you already know. Uh, there are uh, press reviews or uh, reports all the time. Munich does this, Munich does that. Um, I want to show you what uh, the Munich IT is like, what uh, the client's components are, the infrastructure we have, um, some other projects not included in our project, but um, I'll, I'll, sh uh, I'll just show you because um, it somewhat uh, depends on each other when, when you do an o office migration, for example, that's not uh, part of our Linux migration, actually. Um, I want to tell you something about the current state of the project and, and upcoming milestones uh, and then the demo stuff. Um, short history, project approval in 2003, uh, real liftoff in 2005. Um, that's exactly um, the first January 2005 when I started to work for the city of Munich and um, yeah, then the project started. So it's mainly my duty. <laughs> um, free open source for the desktop operating systems, that's a very important point. Um, we don't touching the servers. We have to live with the server infrastructure. Um, we got everything, you'll see later. And um, the recommendation was um, that new uh, applications should be developed, at least platform independent. Um, better would be web interfaces or something like that. Um, yes, um, okay. That's uh, the heterogeneous uh, part of our network infrastructure. Um, we got 14,000 PCs, 16,000 users, um, some Windows NT4, Office 97, 2000. Uh, others uh, need, needed uh, to switch to Y2K, a W2K, and Office 2K. Um, we also bought some uh, used licenses uh, where um, some press agency reported that we're migrating to uh, W2K. I don't know why, that's some strange thing. Um, we got uh, at about 170 special applications that we have to, uh, have to take care of. We got 300 common software products. Um, which are available, available through the whole city of Munich. Um, we got almost every file service imaginable. Um, and um, yeah, the vendors too, of course. Um, many different uh, products for system and config management and installation. Um, Image-based uh, um, installation by, by shoes. Where the administrator goes to the uh, worker and install, it just uh, puts the CD in the um, CD-ROM. Um, and various uh, MS Office based solutions for template and boilerplate management. That's at uh, Nifty Solutions, everybody has to do because he doesn't get his favorite program, so he does it by a word macro or something. Um, yeah, um, what's very important is that we are not um, not the ones who say, you, you gotta set up this client, we're just developing. We are supporting and developing, we're, to, we're doing second and third level support, but uh, the departments, for example, the KVR, uh, which is uh, giving the passports out, uh, has its own IT department, and um, they're installing and administrating their clients and servers. We we're, we're have nothing to do with that, we're just supporting if they run into problems or something. Um, 17 organizational units um, with their own IT. Um, 350 overall IT stuff, that's not us, that's, that's the whole IT stuff from the city of Munich. Um, 
120 Linux project members. Um, that's not the development team, of course. We're just, uh, actually, we're, we're only two. That's us. So, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we got an external uh, support from, from Gonicus, of course, but um, if we run an accident, the project will run into problems for sure. Um, we got a centralized IT strategy, strategy management, uh, which uh, gives most recommendations and hardware procurement. Recommendations uh, because uh, you, you can force the other IT departments to do what, uh, what does not fit in their, in their daily um, workflow. And uh, the first premise has to be um, that the work can be done. Um, yes, and it's a decentralized independent IT operation with their own support concepts. Okay, I think that's it for the complexity part. Um, this has to be enough, okay. Thank you. Um, that's a short overview of um, the, f the components the uh, Linux client um, consists of. Um, it's mostly a Debian Sarge with um, some backported components like uh, KDE 3. 3.5 and New XORG and OpenOffice, um, Thunderbird, uh, Firefox. It's not it's not ice foo or something. It's uh, still Thunderbird because we have to, um, of course, um, give the user some some stable names for the applications, um, or they will be confused. It's it's not that uh, we're we can just simply rename that. Um, we got a new kernel, of course, um, but um, not the edge kernel, um, and a new UDEV. Um, the FIE 2.10 uh, uh, and Gozabi, uh, but it's, it's not a real, real Phi version because we got some uh, own patches in it, um, which we're working with uh, Thomas to get into <laughs> official file releases, but uh, we'll see. We got a little fight. Um, and the upcoming release um, will be based on Edge. We're working hard on that. Um, and of course, there will be some uh, backported uh, packages from Lenny. Okay. Um, that's just a short overview of uh, some of the com uh, components we had to integrate. Um, for example, the LDAP uh, for central system config management for uh, user information, um, addresses, telephone numbers, all uh, is in LDAP at the city of Munich. That's the uh, only central component uh, we, we can trust, if you want so. Um, there are file services, SMB, NCP, uh, business applications, Windows terminal services. Um, the software distribution servers are mostly only our servers. We, we uh, did it separate. There's a client and a, a FIE distribution server for that, um, which also runs Goza. And yeah, that's, that's a picture how it all works from infrastructure view. Um, that's an interesting side note um, about the other sub projects. Actually, it's parallel projects, but um, simply spoken, it's uh, the office migration which is running um, at about 13 templates, macros, and forms are in use at the moment or were in use, in active use, uh, which had to be consolidated, uh, which um, uh, had to be viewed manually. You can't do that automatically. Uh, we had some students do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and the Volmux, that's, which is an own uh, development of our office team, that's a team of uh, separate three people. Um, that's a Java-based document creation system, which um, does um, its work over the uh, OpenOffice Uno interface, API. Um, um, which the main features are um, if a secretary wants to do write a letter for the uh, um, uh, for for uh, their 
um, officer, then he just selects in a drop down, okay, I want a letter for my officer, and then the values are filled from LDAP, and uh, the letter is generated, and she can uh, only um, press print, and uh, it all works. Um, there's a formal form designer, and uh, yeah. Eierlegende Wollmilchsau, it's German for it's, it's uh, you have to do everything and it has to do everything and everything must work and work perfect. Um, then we have the uh, important application migrations. Um, uh, we, we do that mostly with uh, either terminal server based solutions, VMware images, or Vine. Uh, it depends, but uh, for future developments, uh, I already said it, uh, web-based or, or at least platform independent solutions are preferred. Um, and of course the training for the client and for the servers, for the administrators uh, who have to work with uh, the new Linux desktops. Okay, some, some numbers. Um, we've got uh, people using Linux in three departments, mostly voluntary based. Uh, we got two ways of migration uh, in general. That means um, open source applications like OpenOffice, Firefox, and Thunderbird are used on Windows, though the people get used to it and uh, don't recognize the difference when they get Linux installed, when they're in the weekend or something. Um, or switching directly to Linux. Um, uncritical users first. If some user cannot switch because of some applications, then we just ignore it. We won't uh, lose any time. Um, the first release was completed in September 2006. Um, and that's also where the e-learning platform uh, went online. And up to date, uh, 330 workstation computers are already fully converted to Linux or migrated to Linux. Uh, 200 additional test workstations in the upcoming uh, departments are installed and administrated, of course. Uh, uh, 1,300 employees are trained. Thousands of workstations with open source software under Windows are running. 80 administrators uh, trained for Linux. And um, notably, uh, the client usability was confirmed by the German TIFF for, uh, yes, Usability, that's, um, the TÜV is a German institution for, um, um, yeah, I don't know, you know something? Yes, it's some tests, test if the user and, and, and certifies it, puts a stamp on it. Um, it costs money for a stamp, okay, but um, it's, it's uh, definitely important for marketing, for in internal marketing also. Um, and we received, um, the European e-learning award earlier in 2007 for the e-learning platform. And we want to migrate, have migrated 2,000 workstations to Linux in 2007. Okay, that's for the boring part and now we're gonna demo it, um, real installation. Uh, Jan has prepared some VMware images, images to show you. Um, so I hope it all works out. Have fun. I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, we got we got a special work group um, who um, uh, had a had uh, looked at the client um, from a user view. So there were users which were. Um, uh, viewed while they were working with the client when they saw it uh, the first time, and um, yeah, what 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 things were not so good or what what is to improve, and when we implemented all changes they wanted to, um, for example, um, you, you um, the focus um, when you when you look on Jan can you open the start menu please open it. Um, in our client, when you open um, the here, here the the bureau program, what's called Office Tools, um, then you don't get Open Office Org, you get uh, Office Writing Tool or something. So that's a simple example how you aid the users to the right programs, even if they don't know it. And 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the question was if we just uh, implemented the changes and uh, there were no additional review. Did I get it right or? Yeah. Were you working with them or was it Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, there was a special work group for that. Okay. It's a uh, pretty important point. Um, I guess um, from my mind it's, it's, it's about 60 persons of the whole project budget went into um, in, into e-learning and, um, and learning for, for uh, administrators and users. It's not the development which is the big part. But I, I think we, we can take the questions afterwards. It would be great. Um, okay, then I'll give to Jan. Okay. Um, yeah. What do you think now is the uh, first logging the administrator is seeing when he's logging into the Yes, what we call a depot server, which means a software depot where, where all the installation is running from and where all re releases are lying. So I just do a locking now. Um, uh, this is the ma main interfaces. Normally Goza has a lot of more features, but we are just using a few of them for user management, for group management to manage applications and get the systems running. And a very special uh, plugin we were developing in the last one year is the Phi integration. So you can do a, a Debian Phi installation from LDAP uh, directly from a web interface. So I basically I just de deleted the old workstation, so it's not now anymore to the system. So uh, that's the normal stuff. You have DHCP running, you have a PXE running, and now it gets an configuration file from the server which is automatically generated so the server knows that it does not have a client with its name and the MAC address in the database in LDAP and sends them an yeah, installation file so it will check out the hardware it's found and write the initial LDAP object into the database take some time okay it's, n it's not internationalized so that's just written that there's the hardware detection running And since it's running VMs, it takes a little bit more time. And now that it's written, please contact your system administrator, and he will have now a new object in Goza. So, so there's a new device now. You can uh, select, basically select a target system, which means you, for us it's just, you can install a workstation or another server object. We just stay with the workstation. Okay, the, the first thing is you set the installation mode that you activate the system. Then you set up startup options, which means you can select uh, the kernel you want to install, the LDAP server you want to use. So if you, for the whole city we have a s uh, distributed LDAP server, so you have fallback if the uh, local servers and the uh, departments are not running, they automatically go to the main one, but you can select them here. We just stay with the default server, you can select the installation server. 
and you will select a release. Uh, that's something I will show later. We just install the current default or development version. That's Lemux. You select the file class you want to add. Okay. Then you define the devices like keyboard and like the resolution and the driver for for X. This will hopefully get better when yeah uh, when we are switching to Edge. I think Lenny will have X seven point three, so maybe we'll get some kind of auto configuration for X there. Uh, otherwise, now you have to just enter some values. Normally you can use DDC, but it's not really supported by VMware, so we just add some. And then simply saving the object. And then you can, s can see that, okay, the, the picture is not that good. The configuration is running now. It generates from the, from the LDAP information, it generates the file config space. So it's basically dropping all the required LDAP objects which make this installation into pl uh, plain text files. Because I have toggled before the, the virtual terminal, normally it's switching automatically just so the user sees just the progress bar. This is just simply parsing the FAI output and printing some numbers and calculating the phase where the current installation is running. So now it's formatting the hard disk. Um, all the installation normally on a PC is about 12 minutes for 1.5 gigabyte of software, all the scripts are running, all, all the adaption of the hardware. Uh, this will take about, on the VM, half, half an hour, 20 minutes. So we'll just continue with, uh, with some more stuff from the presentation while it's installing. So what you can see, what's different from a normal installation with Fi is first you have the DHCP request and a PXE. Linux is running. This is really normally contacting just a TFTP server, but we implemented an own TF TFTP, Fi daemon, and LDAP kind of daemon, which is just delivering all the stuff directly from the LDAP. So the PXE Linux requests a uh, uh, config for a MAC address. The daemon looks that up in the uh, LDAP directory, generates on the fly the configuration file and delivers it to the client. So you can just manage your whole clients in the LDAP directory. This is really running on the, fl on the fly. And after that, we have a special uh, hook. It's, uh, it's the only hook we are really using from Fi which just uh, is called the config hook, which normally gets your configuration from an SVN or from an external server. So what we are doing is simply we are, we are running a tool LDAP25, which drops the configuration based on the client classes and releases. And while the uh, installation is running, it's normally sending to uh, status updates to file monitoring daemon. We also catch that and write those status into LDAP so you can see if the uh, installation is running fine or if there are errors or w what's going on. So well what are the main uh, changes we made to Fi and all this stuff is that we, uh, we switched from the normal IPs status configuration to Mac based um, because that uh, for us is much easier and for uh, in the LDAP we use the Mac for as the main information and identifier for our system. Um, we added uh, init RAM FS support 
So we do not use the normal five kernels, which are distributed in such, but we use one kernel for everything. So the kernel is running the client, the kernel is running the servers, and the kernel is running the installation. So you do not get problems when with different kernel versions where the installation and the configuration doesn't match. Um, next is NFS version 4 support, which was required by our security people in the city, um, which means uh, you just have one port. You do not need to open all firewalls. You just can use the, I think, 2049 port for NFS 4, and everything is going over that port. So that's hopefully a little, for them, it's much more secure. Um, yeah. The then uh, there's this enchants D, you can say, which do the TFTP and PXE, and the status updates in LDAP. And yeah, the, the dumping tool to really dump our release informations and file informations on the local disk. And the, this little tool which just parses the file output and prints some st progress bar. So Basically for us, we have developed uh, five main FAE, FAI classes. First class is really the client, which means the basic system, which is normally installed for all the people in the uh, in the city. Then there's a little enhanced version of the basis client, which just has some more administrative tools. We call it admin PC. Then there's a special functionality because First we thought, okay, everything is in LDAP. What is the best way s we get an installation which can run without an LDAP server? Obviously there you could just create all, all the files locally which from the LDAP information, um, but that would be a, a lot more work because now the user management and everything is connected to the LDAP. So the idea was simply create a caching feature which just when the user logins cre creates a cache for the machine and the user. And so you can, after the first login, you can simply switch off the net and the user login will run fine for all, uh, w even without the network. That's basically used for, for telecommuters, which are just not working most of the time in the city and are outside of the city with notebooks. Um, the most mm, other interesting class is really the uh, depot server, which means it's a, a complete server running Goza, running Phi, and having all the release uh, repositories. So with this, you can replicate the releases into the city. So you do not have a, a local server where everybody is installing from, but you can every every time you can say, okay, uh, for this department there's not a good connection do a new installation and then you just enter uh, uh, something like a parent server where it's synchronized to and so the local installation is running from this server and this server gets it updates from the parent server and so you have a distributed installation mechanism in the whole city especially because w there are some out outer departments just, just going by ISDN so it's very, very slow line, and you cannot install, okay, you could install clients over that, but I think it takes days to get an installation. Um, um, what you can also do in Goza generally is just create for a, a CD from a file configuration. It means to just go to the, go to the workstation and say, okay, I want this installation in a department which does not have a network connection, probably, and you get a CD and it puts a CD or a DVD, okay, for us it's a DVD, we got a lot of software, and you get a running system. Okay, we have talked a lot, uh, or mentioned a few times the Goza Go system, for everybody who does not, have, uh, does not have heard of it, it's basically just an LDAP management tool. So what you can do, you can really manage a lot of stuff like users, groups, you can manage applications, uh, you can manage your systems, um, the FI, what we did, and you can uh, combine systems to call object groups. There are a lot of more plugins available in the internet, just check out their homepage. There's a lot of 
okay, and maybe not a lot, but there's quite some documentation there and how to set up goes are running on your own PCs. Okay, let's see if how much the installation is running. Okay, it will take some time, some more, but there's a second, there's a pre-installed client, so if it's now at 30%, I think it at least would take an hour, 20 minutes, I don't know. So I'll ju I will jim simply kill it and use the pre-installed version. Okay. Well, yeah. While we are waiting for the VMware to start up, is there already some questions to answer? Uh, I don't know. Um, are you doing? Are you doing updates and migrations and that sort of thing? Are we doing them updates? Yeah. Are you doing like app get? upgrade on the machines and things um, once they're installed? Normally Fi has a mechanism, it's Fi soft update and basically that's what we are using. Okay. So the soft update is just the normal file without almost just partitioning. So you do not do the real partitioning, but otherwise it's just running Fi. It gets up right. get update, it gets the scripts running again. So they have to be in depot then. So you can run them more than once without destroying the whole system. Uh, that's a little okay. bit complicated, but I didn't know about that. You and can tr you can trigger that inside of Goza. You just go there to the workstation. Okay, uh, as you can see, there's now the the client is starting up. You go simply to the workstation. too much stuff for a little notebook. <laughs> and you're going to do migrations to the next version, you, you know, from Sarge to Edge, using the same upgrade tool? Um, to Edge, I'm not sure if that will work. We're just checking that out. Currently, we are just first uh, porting our stuff, but normally the installation is 12 minutes. So if you have really an <coughs> incomp incompatible version where you cannot do the simple soft update, you just say, okay, install it with PC. Because we, what we are doing, we have kind of mechanism for roaming profiles, so when the user logs out, the whole home directory is comp copied to the server. Because since we, we cannot change the, uh, uh, the server systems running, we just have SMB and NCPFS. And so you cannot use that as real home directory. So what we are doing is saving, yeah, saving all the flags and copy all the stuff. And the user should normally just put most of his stuff into a network drive, which is mounted when you are logging in. So what you have in the first page, there are some actions. Okay, now the, the client is not running. No, if the client is running, you can directly trigger new installation where the user gets a pop-up and says, hey, the administrator wants to do a new installation, please close all your stuff, and or wants to reboot, or whatever you can imagine. And for this, okay, I have just killed it, so there's just a reinstall or the scheduled update which is running on the next boot up. And by this, it's badly doing via SHH, and there's a user with a, with a certificate with a key there, and it can run, I think, three or four commands. And so uh, the security is quite high because nobody co really could use it to do something on the client. It's just for those commands. Okay. So, yeah. Now this is uh, the login stream. Since it's just 800, 600 pixels, it's a little bit compressed, but that's basically it. And Ooh, it's not a secure password, only 
It's, it's a test, it's from a test laboratory, so there are no secure passwords. <laughs> Obviously, that's not the same password I'm using for, the no for my normal PC. So now the login is running. This is the pre-configuration which is running before Kadi uh, is really starting up. So it's, it's setting printers, it's setting USB devices, it's setting or changing the uh, resolution, it's creating the KDE menu, it's creating the, the desktop icons, it's creating the panel and a few more stuff. I have some sh sheets in the demonstration and now the really buzz client is and KDE is running and that's it. So ob obviously everything was configured the way that it l looks like Microsoft. We have to say that because we have the most people in the city never have seen a, a Linux system before and we want to keep the training low and actually we have also already spent or we wanted to spend already half of the money for the training and while due this configuration we, we even could just keep the cost quite low so there's not really something you would not expect from anything, it's just plain KDE. There the, the only difference is that the menu is just generated when they log in from the application configured in Goza. So, okay. So it was about the client startup, then the login screen, then the pre-configuration, then Kali Splash and the desktop. So what's really happening and where all this configuration is got from LDAP is at two points. First is the boot process. In the boot process, yeah, the, you generate an insta and first LDAP configuration. Then X is configured to start up correctly. Um, you get an correct app installation and syslogging and time servers. All the rest is configured when the user logs in. So you recreate the LDAP cache if, if required. Um, we configure printers for, so CAPS is configured. Um, special UDIF rules are generated because in the city it's n normally not allowed um, to use any external storage devices. So people do not bring stuff on their computers or bags on it, but you can, in Goza, you can enter USB IDs and allow them to work. Then you have all those shares mounted. You get a, a special kiosk profile, which configures KDE and allows the users yeah, to have a shell or not and different stuff. You get the syncing of a roaming profile um, there are special locking scripts we can you can assign to the users, and at least you generate the KDE menu and all the applications for the system. So, yeah, that's a that's a really short overview. Uh, the administration, yeah, book. It's all yeah. You can say really it's a book for for the normal administrators in the city just to get some introduction stuff. Is few hundred pages already, so it's nothing you can yeah, just show everything in, in an hour, and you just have, yeah, I don't know how much time is left. A few minutes are left, so better we have 10 minutes to go and answer some questions. And yeah, bring a, you, want to bring, you want to bring the microphone over? Yes. It's, I think it's easier sure. than... <laughs> Yeah, you, you mentioned during your introduction that you began with uncritical users. So could you give, you, give us a more accurate definition of what are uncritical users? Uncritical? Okay, the, cr the, cr the critical part is not the user, it's uh, the application the user is using. Um, if you uh, corrupt the workflow, for example, for uh, getting passports out, you get a problem, of course, because uh, 
people have to pay for their passports and they don't want to spend five hours waiting because uh, the Linux client has some problem with some application. So that's a critical uh, user, if you want so. Okay, uh, my question was more about strategy for deploying such uh, disruptive changes. Um, experience shows that, and I imagine you had the same experience, that it's not usually widely accepted or there are resistance to change. And what I would define myself as uncritical users and the first one to start with is upper management. So my opinion, but I don't know if the strategy you used, the first person to use this desktop should be the mayor of the city of Munich. He already is. But yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, but uh, I think the mayor is not a critical person. <laughs> In our <laughs> not not from a technical point of view. Um, it's his secretary. <laughs> you, I, I've never seen anybody typing so fast. Believe in me. Any further questions? I think I have uh, maybe a similar question. Uh, you started with 300 and you now have uh, 330 PCs uh, migrated to Linux, but uh, there are, let's say, more than 10,000, 12,000 left. What is your, your time uh, table for that? Um, of course, we're not fixed uh, uh, until as we wanted to initially. Uh, until the end, uh, by the end of 2008, we wanted to be finished. But um, you can't really uh, plan that accurately. Um, uh, the departments are pretty big. Uh, there are some departments, for example, the, um, for the social work, where there are several thousand users in one big block, and there are uh, small departments which are only uh, a couple of hundred or dozens um, of users. And um, we, we try to do one, one big one next, and then a, pa a couple of small departments uh, after that, and we'll see how it develops. But mm -hmm. initially, we wanted to be finished uh, by the end of 2008. Um, okay, uh, let's say I'm, I'm from Vienna, and there's another project in Vienna, the, the, the Venux project. And they have, a, as far as I know, a different approach. Uh, is this still the goal of, of, of Linux to, to move, uh, to, to migrate all? Really, every uh, 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 this this goal no. is, is not. Uh yeah, the, were, the target really was to migrate eighty percent because there are some three D software running for or ge geological special software which we will never be able to really migrate. They won't work. So the target was from our fourteen thousand PCs you know, migrate about twelve thousand. Uh, okay, and was so for, for the end of the year, it's, I think it's r really manageable to do the first 2,000 because currently in all the departments there are tests running and if the tests are completed and the people there and the administrator says, okay, all my requirements are met and I can really do the rollout, then it's quite fast because you just have to say, okay, 15 minutes for the first 10 PCs, then next 15 minutes for the next 10 PCs, so after that it's quite easy, but the work before really doing the rollout is quite hard because there, I, there was one year of planning actually to say, okay, what are your requirements? And, and currently we said, okay, all the requir requirements are met and the people are coming and saying, okay, nice to have this, but I also need that and that and that and that. And I have this vendor which, cannot, which doesn't give out a Linux version even as it says, a year ago, okay, no problem, there will be one. And yeah, this is the main problem with it. Um, and you also mentioned the usage of, of VMware. Is this uh, an option for, uh, for a larger scale? That means that more than uh, a few users will use uh, Linux as their first desktop, that's a primary system, and uh, VMware for special applications? Um, or is this only a, how uh, we call it, uh, for few cases? Uh, for us, it's mainly for really a few cases because normally you have to deliver the whole image and this is quite quite large even for installation and you have to have another license. So it's not really an option. For most of the time we tried to, to use it uh, wine 
and we have some uh, external company who's helping to adapt the special software to Wine and get that running. So I think that's the primary option. And we, after that, when it's running, we simply put the Wine version with the application in the Debian package, and it gets installed, and so the user can start that. That's, I think, the main progress. Otherwise, yeah, VMware is especially nice for testing in, in the labs when the people come and want to test new hardware or something like that and or new installation, it's quite good. But for real distribution, I don't think it will be high demand. Uh, will there be a license change for Vormux? It currently only allows debugging and development of OpenOffice. Yeah, um, uh, there's the license. The license. The license. It says on the web. Uh, the city of Munich gives you a license for installation and use of the software solely for the purpose of open office uh, or debugging yeah. and development. Yeah. There's, uh, there are a few, I can say, legal problems. Because now what the main problem is that the state, uh, how to say that? The state is not allowed to real to be concurrent to any company. So if we re release something, and the, the next hairdryer is saying, "Okay, if you give me that much money, I could do the same," the state would be in problem. The people are figuring out how to release the stuff, but those versions from Volmux and which are distributed are mainly there because we found Open Office problems, which were crashing Open Office from Volmux. And so we put that out so the developer can really test that. But well, we will see. It's not, we, were, we are asking a few times if there is some progress going. But yeah, it's not our position to release anything. So that's something Yeah, I think it's a little bit poor management. But we cannot do anything about that. And actually, we have already. 250 changes in our change management for the next few versions, which somebody was calculating would take us 17 years to to implement. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I hope that there is going some progress, but I don't know. Do you actually get free software developers to look at your stuff when you license it like that? Wouldn't that be like a complete blocker to get the Open Office developers to actually look at the? Uh, the files you provide when you are limited, limiting it uh, with that license? Um, uh, we actually don't want to limit it. We, we're just not uh, clear what the license could be for us. Uh, we definitely want to give it out. Um, while um, we're at the moment mostly documenting. So um, the decision from the upper management how to give it out um, is not that important at the moment. So because we're just documenting, you, you, can't, uh, you can read the source, of course, if we give it out, but uh, you will have problems in getting it running without a configuration, examples, and stuff like that. Well, I'm did it answer I'm your a free question software or did I get it wrong somewhere? I, I don't think you understand the problem. Uh, I'm a free software developer. Yeah. And I'm very careful with the license of the source I read because if mm -hmm. I'm not, I might uh, have a few lawyers visiting my house to mm -hmm. do nasty things to me. Sure. And uh, because of that, I would not read the files you put on the web with that kind of license because then your lawyers might show up at my house to do nasty things. So that's a real problem. If you actually want free software developers to look at your files mm -hmm. and fix the software bugs that you have discovered, that license is not going to work. Okay. Yeah, I understand the problem, but um, um, also that's, that's the case for the, for the Volmux, not for the uh, client part and the FIE part, because we're, we're already based on free software. We got to give it out somehow, and you can uh, have a look at it for sure. We have to provide you a look at it. And you won't, as, as far as I understand, the GBL. Um, you have to and you won't run in any problems. That's, that's what the GPL is for. Um, another thing is the, is the Walmux. Um, 
I don't know what license it will be, but I do know that uh, the lead developer is very engaged in that, um, in working at the draft at the GPL version 3, and um, he will do everything to get the right license for the product. I don't know what it will be. Sounds good. Hi, so um, I'm doing s very similar things at the institute that I work at. Not nearly as sophisticated as the stuff you've got here yet, but similarly, I'm using Fay to install desktops and blah, blah, blah. One of the issues that I have, and I'm curious to understand how you've addressed it, is like you, I'm having, I'm having to deal with a mixture of um, Linux desktops that I'm administering, and there's the Windows desktops that the Windows guys are administering. They're all on the same network, so mixing together, getting, and we really want a single centralized Pixie and DHCP setup. I don't want to be maintaining separate things, and I'm still curious as to how you've approached that particular problem. Have you, uh, have you got sort of, does everything Pixie boot off the same server and you have, is Goza managing whether something then actually boots off a Windows server or a um. Linux server? In fact, we have uh, not addressed this at all. We're, as, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're developing and we're giving out recommendations. Uh, we help installing the servers initially and we're looking at the environment, um, what the DHCP configuration is and where we could place our installation server. But uh, it's in fact an, the, the duty of the departments to get it running. We're, we're supporting that, of course, but um, right. As you may have seen, we have a very, very heterogeneous uh, network, yeah. and um, yeah, of course we got problems. We got uh, problems with uh, Nobel 6.5 DHCP servers, which uh, have a bug in um, uh, broadcasting, uh, uh, PXE, uh, TFTP boot file names, boot image file names, um, the Unicode signs in it. I don't know why, but it's definitely a bug. Uh, no one knows about it, but they, of course, don't uh, do anything. Um, yeah, we, we got problems, we, we can't address that. We, we have to look at uh, the picture um, uh, when we visit the department, for example. So do you have people using Landesk as well? For sure, but I don't know them. We, we got oh, okay. everything for sure, uh, I don't doubt. But uh, if you get a uh, special question in that direction, you're always welcome to write them via email. Yeah. Either to, to me or Jan or uh, the central email address. Any other questions? I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> um, you, you call Limex a distribution. Does that, mi does that mean you, like, you rebuild all the packages? Or you, is it a Debian derivative more so? We rebuild not all packages, but uh, yeah, uh, the, the backported ones mostly we, we built it for us uh, because uh, we wanted to be sure that it worked. Um, so, it yeah, we, we, we did not build all packages. We, we of course, okay. did just uh, search base and then yeah. the, the work came. And uh, <coughs> I was going to ask, like, productivity of people who are using these Linux desktops. Is, is, there, is it better than Windows? I mean, is there any, like, tangible benefits besides using free software type stuff. Uh, you mean if they work more effectively with Something uh, free like that. software? Okay. Yes, if you give them more coffee, they will do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but basically, uh, people are just saying we have some information days every half a year where people which are not using Linux in their department can come and see some, some installations and can play with it. And normally, the people are just saying, it's not really different. It just feels like, yeah, like Windows. And that's what we were really targeted for, so we do not have to bring, yeah, bring, uh, train a lot of new stuff. And yeah, I don't think it's more effective or less effective. It's just most the same. My question's related, really, to that one. How much training are you giving Pair standard administrative type user, and once it's been given and they've gone back to use the new desktop, what evaluation on that training are you doing? Um, 
So we got uh, we get basic blocks for all users. All users get that blocks. It's I don't know uh, a, a from a couple of days to a week. Um, I think they can choose. Um, and then you got that optional blocks, it's just uh, e-learning, um, where they just sign up uh, and with the username and, and they can choose which lessons they want to take. Um, for example, if I'm not sure uh, how to create a, a, a table in, in Calc, you just uh, sign up in the web interface and uh, okay, how to create a table, you get flash animations with sound and just do that and this. Uh, this is one big part and uh, of course you got uh, additional courses for users and administrators uh, which you can sign up for. You just get, everybody has to get the basic block and then you, you, you ha just have to join. So is the answer about two days up to about five days? I think the minimum is three days. Right. And the maximum is about five days? That's the uh, maximum for the initial course. You, right. you got. Uh, you you don't have any any restrictions. How much ho how much e-learning uh, somebody can do because he can always sign up and redo some lessons. Is there any tracking of how much training are given on average the individuals are doing, and how much retraining they're going back to to doing? Not yet. <laughs> okay. How many desktops have you rolled out now out of the twelve thousand you're expecting? Sorry, what, what? Of the 12,000 desktops uh, you're expecting to roll out, how I many desktops have you I rolled out? I think you, you just uh, missed it. It's at the moment productive, it's 330. That's uh, a month ago. But uh, it, it will grow. Okay. At what point in, in the rollout are you anticipating checking how much training people are doing and how effective the training is being? Because you've mentioned earlier that this is by far the most expensive yeah. aspect of, of the whole rollout. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm just, um, uh, you know, I'm just a developer. That's uh, <laughs> it's going too deep. I think uh, we'll uh, have to finish. Um, please, if you have any questions, get me or write an email or get Jan. Um, Final note, I personally and uh, the whole team uh, of, of uh, the Linux team and the distribution want to thank you, uh, Debian, for the distribution. Uh, you did a great work, great base. Also Thomas, of course, uh, with FIE. And uh, we and I personally will be glad to give something back very soon. I don't know, don't know exactly what I can do for you perhaps help with the security team, it's my, one of my main duties or something, but we want definitely uh, to do that and yeah, thank you. Thank you.